Sounds good. Hi and welcome. I see our attendees are filling in. If you are here to discuss extinct and possibly soon to be no longer extinct butterflies with Alta Live, you are in the right place. Welcome. I'm gonna give it a minute or so while our audience fills in. And while we do that, I'm gonna take care of my bookkeeping, which is far less interesting than our very special guests today. Thank you for joining us at Alta Live, the digital event series we do at Alta Journal. I'm Beth Spotswood, I'm Alta's digital editor. And today I am really excited to welcome California Academy of Sciences Senior Research Fellow, Darrell Capon and Alta Journal contributor, John, Mar John Markov. Um, today we're gonna talk about uh, uh, how scientists are studying to uh, preserved specimens of the Circe's butterfly. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, Xerxes butterfly. Um, and we're working to return this butterfly from extinction. John has written this extraordinary art article in Alta, um, and we're gonna send you links to this afterwards. But what we're gonna do today is kind of expand on John's reporting. We're gonna talk to Darrell about the extraordinary work that's happening around this species of butterfly. And we're gonna take your questions. So here's how it's gonna work. John is gonna interview Darrell for about 25 minutes. Then we're going to get to your questions. Please pose them in the chat or use the question that Q and A button you see below. I'm going to pop back for the last five minutes of this interview and we're gonna to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. If you've missed any part of this, if you had an amazing time and wanna relive it or share it with others, this conversation is being recorded. I'm gonna shoot you an email. If you're registered for this event, I will send you an email with a recording of this event, links to John's amazing work in Alta, links to the work that Darrell and the numerous um, teams involved in this project are working on, as well as anything else they touch upon, I think you might find interesting later. So please stay tuned for that. Or if you've got to leave early, don't worry, I've got you covered. Um, if you're new to us, if you're a butterfly fan who's just joined us for the first time, Alta is a quarterly journal. We're focused on California and the West. We uh, weekly, we host events like these featuring poets, creators, innovators, conservationists, scientists, and writers like John and Durrell. We also host a monthly California book club. Um, we hope you enjoy what we do. And so with that, I'm gonna get lost and turn this over to our experts, Durrell and John. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. And hi, Durrell. Okay. Um, let me start by asking you to tell us a little bit about Xerxes' fa fate. I mean, it's kind of a, it's a sad tale. And could you sort of lay out what happened to Xerxes? Sure. So after the gold rush, San Francisco was rapidly developing. And the um, outer lands, the foggy west portions of the city, were being turned into what we see today, large neighborhoods, a few large parks, and people were moving towards sort of, that was the initial suburbs for the city after the rebuilding from the, uh, initial, the great fire and earthquake. And so um, during that time, the dunes in Western San Francisco were converted, as I said, to mostly to housing and in some cases to a small fraction at Golden Gate Park. And, there, and, and a lot of it was also um, converted in the Presidio, which we know is is sort of a very large area that in, formerly had many military installations, including a hospital that we just talked about a bit. We have shared history there. So that, habit, that, that conversion led to habitat destruction for a special plant and a special butterfly. And Xerxes through the early um, 1900s into the 1930s was rapidly declining. Um, the host plant that it may have been mostly eating at that time would have been a small weed called deer weed. And um, as the dunes were stabilized and those plants were removed and the place they were turned to basically asphalt and homes, the Xerxes started to go uh, extinct. And the winking out of the Xerxes happened sometime after the war, after the war or right in the middle of World War II. Yeah. So, um... I wanted to also ask you a little bit about the Academy's 
uh, collection, one of the things that I, I just have to mention, because it was one of the neatest things that ever happened to me as a reporter, was the tour I got of the old Academy collection, which was this Indiana Jones moment for me, where I walked into this long room where the bottles went off forever into the distance, including, I think there was something from the Beagle, um, Darwin's expedition. I mean, it was just an amazing thing. But anyway, you have a, you have a bunch of Circes. So this is really kind of an interesting, interesting uh, moment to have a museum when we're all struggling to find out what is reality. Museums are the storehouse of knowledge. And ever since Linnaeus and even before the father of taxonomy, people collected life and basically stuck it in those drawers. Now people think of them as dusty drawers or old bottles. I also had the same exact experience. I was an undergrad at Berkeley. When I became interested in uh, evolution and ecology, I decided to switch from birds to butterflies. I found a professor from England who suggested a species to study. So I went to the academy, I got invited inside behind the scenes, was able to open drawers and look at my future, my, my life right there for seven or eight years in, in South America. We won't go into that, but nearby, very nearby, were over 450 specimens of Xerxes. And I had no clue that I was sort of walking past something that I'd be coming back to. That's neat. So there is a discussion about bringing, bringing Xerxes back. <clears throat> it could be the first one of the, maybe it could be the first species brought back from extinction possibly. And there are a couple of paths. I first wanted to ask you about the Academy's role in this. Um, an organization called Revive and Restore has funded you to sequence Circes. And I wanted, to, I wanted to ask how how much of that is still new science and how have you done? Okay, so the, the basic idea is that uh, amongst all those 450 specimens are a, at least uh, a large fraction of them where the DNA is preserved on the pin butterfly. And um, Revive and Restore has been working with the Presidio Trust to understand um, what the habitat was like and, and to think about where we could locate a butterfly in the same uh, genus that could stand in for the Xerxes as an initial goal. Ideally, we would find um, what was unique about Xerxes and, and locate those sort of unique evolutionary adaptations in other taxa. I'm gonna call it taxa right now. But basically, there's a species called the silvery blue. It looks very much like this specimen of the Xerxes blue behind me. And it's widespread in North America. And we believe Xerxes is a offshoot of that species. So our first step is to actually use the specimens, which are the last remaining information about the Xerxes butterfly, to non-destructively sample DNA and then compare it to these, this other group the, the, that may be uh, inclusive of Xerxes called the silvery blue butterflies. And um, have you started that process? So we started it, this is like almost the, the, the fastest I've ever worked on, on a project like this. We started in January and we had our first DNA data back and analyzed just three weeks ago. And we're seeing sort of the range of variation amongst the silvery blue and where this Xerxes blue sits in that. And I'll just go straight to the punchline. It's super exciting. Xerxes looks like it's very clustered in its own little group that is a subgroup of this overall range of variation. So there's gonna be a lot of argument in the literature about is it a species, is it not a species? That's not the really important thing. The important thing is what was unique about Xerxes in its unique habitat in San Francisco and that's what we have our eyes laser focused on to figure out so we can help bring a silvery blue back to San Francisco's Presidio dunes. And the components of an ecosystem that are relevant, there, there's, there's climate, there's food, there's symbiotic animals uh, or other symbiotic, sym symbiotic creatures. Are there other things that go into the mix? Sure, the, the Xerxes and the silvery blues are part of the Lycaenid butterflies, that's their family. And those butterflies, many of them, get tended by ants. So we have like a multi-layered uh, ecological problem to solve, or, desert, uh, or the but blue butterflies do. They need to be able to survive the temperatures of the Presidio. 
the foggy climate. They need to have the right host plants. The ants that would tend them as larvae underground need to be there. And then we, they need to uh, arrive, and that could either be due to dispersal or if we assist them with the translocation. So all those things have to <coughs> make it work. And um, if you brought them back, um, how quickly could you know a silver blue turn into a Xerxes? Well, this is a I think I, I think I'd like to step back for a second. If we think about the goal of restoration or regenerating uh, the, the, the dune habitat, the presidios, we really want to see a butterfly flying around there, and we'd love it to be as close to Xerxes as possible. But that's because we have the hypothesis that something like Xerxes will do well there. So the first step has not been to sort of go Jurassic Park on this and to, and to think about putting all of Xerxes genes back into a silvery blue for that spot. Although that might be possible and it might be desirable, figuring out whether that's desirable is, is a longer conversation. But one of the first steps will be just to see what was different about Xerxes. So we are deep sequencing a silvery blue butterfly and we will do a bunch of deep sequencing of, of Xerxes specimens and then we'll be able to compare the two. In, in you mentioned the sort of Jurassic Park idea. In talking to the scientists um, who are uh, exploring this world, it became pretty clear to me that we're, we're much farther away from that kind of a feat than than I thought from certainly the popular literature and maybe even the sort of science I knew about. Um, my sense was that very little is known about the, the function of the genes in butterflies at this point. Well, with the exception of the handful of genes in these uh, long-winged butterflies that you can see when the academy's open in the rainforest dome right now, or a, a group of genes that are in the same family that have to do with spot patterns. Um, we do not know a huge amount about butterfly genes, but actually we do not know a huge amount about genes in general. Even though the Human Genome Project was completed 20 years ago, the initial idea was sort of that there would be a one-to-one -one blueprint, gene equals some sort of trait like this blue reflective scales, equals the fitness of that butterfly because it's got those blue scales and those are good for whatever reason. And that's not how it works. There's a complex evolutionary developmental process that leads to individuals, um, very individual variation. So I think we have to like recognize our profound ignorance in the face of a massive amount of knowledge that we have. Well, um you know, so the original food of the Xerxes is there, the ants are there, but has the climate changed so much that it, 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 we're not in the same world or not in the same ecosystem? Um, we definitely know in general, we're not in the same world as say 1905 um, Presidio dunes before the, the quake and the whole over a hundred years of change. But there are butterflies that are in this uh, silvery blue species, subspecies of butterflies that are surviving in current environments. And those environments actually span the range of variation we see that, that the Presidio includes. So there, the silvery blue types could be ranging from Arcata to San Diego and into Baja, California on the coast. They also range through the East Bay and even into the mountains. And so we know that across California, the variation necessary to be successful in one spot exists, but we actually don't know where it is, what it looks like, and how to cap, you know, how to how to uh, collect that variation in the in terms of individual butterflies from different from a population and make sure that they're successful in the presidio. And so that's actually one of our goals is to figure out how to do that in an inexpensive way because conservation cannot be a million or $20 million project for every single restoration or revival of a species. It has to be something that's more pragmatic, more duct tape, mud and boots, as I like to say. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I, I, I imagine the butterflies are not what are called keystone species, but could they, I, I was reading recently about the, the challenges faces, facing the monarch in some places. 
and I wonder to what extent butterflies are, are canaries, in, if you'll, you know, pardon the analogy. No, no, that's fine. Actually, insects in general are able to rapidly respond to changes in the environment. And one of the reasons is that they have very fast life cycles. They also process an incredible amount of energy. So butterflies are in the moth and butterflies group. So Xerxes is, a, is a, basically in the same group that includes moths. Together, that group processes a ton of host plants as larvae. They chew on a bunch of species. And so monitoring butterfly populations, among other insects, can give us a barometer on sort of ecosystem health. And for the monarch specifically, we know that that barometer is telling us that its host plant, the milkweed, is doing really poorly, and that its wintering grounds in Mexico specifically for most North American monarchs are being, uh, are highly endangered, and not just by habitat destruction, but also possibly that interacting with climate change. Since we were both, uh, I think we both grew up in California, one of the experiences I had as a kid is when you drove to the Sierras to the Central uh, Valley, your windshield would be covered with bugs. And that's no longer true. Um, I mean, is, what is that, you know? This is, a, this is actually one of the frightening things. We were talking about change. In Germany, a study the last couple of years said that some places on long-term insect biomass has gone down by 70%. And so that's what we're noticing when we're, our windshields aren't covered with bugs. And there are projects actually to, to sample insects off of vehicles to see if that, if that's a way of, of showing this, but a decrease in the number of insects and the biomass of insects has profound implications for the functioning of ecosystems. Little butterflies like the Xerxes are probably only a fraction of the biomass out there, but they're part of this, as you said, canary early warning system. And so um, we're excited to be working on this particular project because we might be able to turn it around for at least one species. And, um... Have you, I don't know, I think that the, the Presidio Trust, and this is one of a number of projects at the Presidio Trust, um, I've, I've heard they've brought back mussels, they've brought back a, a number of species that used to be there and were also pushed out. Or have you been involved in more than... Is this is the first project that I've been involved locally with the Presidio Trust, but I would like to just say that that idea of figuring out what's important in your backyard and trying to restore what's important in your backyard is a form of regeneration or regenerative thinking. And the Academy is actually really excited to be working on these kinds of projects because we basically nearly finished a new um, one year pandemic lockdown, uh, new mission creation. And our new mission is to regenerate the natural world through science, learning, and especially collaboration. So this is an example of that. So. I just want to ask you a little bit about the term regeneration. Um, so bringing back a habitat, are there other e examples that, I mean, what, what's the breadth of? I think we have to think really broadly about this because one of the, one of the key issues, why does Xerxes, why did it go extinct? Well, it was a small species and it probably wasn't barely noticed and development basically removed its habitat. So to regenerate the natural world, we have to ask, well, what's our role as stewards of, of the ecosystem that supports us? And I think it means, yes, improving habitat, bringing back new species or, 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 or substitutes for extinct species, making the connections between species uh, function again. That may be really important. But more importantly, none of this will happen unless we actually change our relationship with nature. So we can't, we need to regenerate ourselves. When I go to Tennessee Valley, which is just on the other side of the Golden Gate from the Presidio. And I look for the proper habitat for a silvery blue butterfly. And I see, like last night I was there, I saw a moth at midnight. I see that connection between say a willow leaf and a moth. I'm like, wow, this is making me much healthier. And if we do that on purpose, human populations will become healthier as the ecosystems are regenerated. A, a, a specific question. I, I got the sense that you were able to extract um, DNA from the Xerxes specimens without destroying them. Is that is that the case? And is that yeah. 
an that's, art that's, firm? That's, or... It's amazing. And I just want to give a big shout out to the team, uh, Athena, Matt, David, Chris, and Jim. Athena is an expert on uh, museum genomics, Athena Lamb, and she was able to, our uh, entomology curator, uh, curators, curatorial assistants were able to remove the legs temporarily from one side of the body. And we literally soak those in a tiny tube with a tiny bit of proteinase K. And then we dry them out and put them back in an envelope next to specimen. Wow. So that gives us enough DNA to do the genome sequencing, which is just phenomenal. Those specimens basically represent like a time capsule to go back in time and look at what was there in the past. On the spectrum, how complex are butterfly genomes? Are they simpler than we are? Are they as complex? Well, I think there's a kind of an interesting, there's a problem. The genomes themselves have two kinds of complexity. There's a total amount of DNA, and then there's the number of genes that actually create, a gene is something that creates a protein. Um, and so basically creates a building blocks for proteins through this thing called messenger RNA. And when we look at the number of genes that a butterfly has and the number of genes that a human has, it's on the same order of magnitude but the genomes are much smaller. Um, for this, this butterfly, it's probably uh, four to five times smaller than the human genome. You mentioned the question of whether Xerxes is a species or not. Could you, could you talk well, a little so bit about that? There's, there's really two, two ways of thinking about species. Species like the difference between, um, uh, let me think of something that's really, really common in the Bay Area. Uh, well, if I can't, so maybe between humans and chimpanzees, we've been, we divided uh, from a most recent common ancestor many, many millions of years ago. And in fact, between humans and all other great apes, many millions of years ago. And so most of the history of the genes in, have accumulated mutations for that, those millions of years of splitting. And so that's like a very good idea that we're definitely different species almost all parts of the genome show that history of, of splitting. And we can use a random sample or the complete genome to trace back and come up with an evolutionary tree of the, of the variation in all the great apes, including humans. That's why we know we're part of that group. For butterflies, we're going to be using the uh, same techniques, but in some cases, only some small part of the genome is showing a different history. And for instance, for the butterflies I studied for my PhD, the Heliconius butterflies, it was clear that certain adaptations that allowed them to be brightly colored and boldly patterned were um, very different between different uh, organisms we're calling species because they wouldn't interbreed when we brought them together. They don't like to interbreed with each other. But if we force them to in a cage, they still could. When we look at their genomes, only a small fraction of the genome shows the divergence and the rest is shared. So that's like an incipient or just beginning species. So for Xerxes, we don't know if it's in that situation where it could be diverging or if it's just uh, a highly divergent variant of a, of a larger species. So we might call it a subspecies. We're not sure yet, but um, that's, that's the explanation. What, one last question. We're getting close to, uh, I see we have some questions that I wanted to bring Beth back, but I did want to ask you sort of about the nitty gritty of relocating, relocating a population. If there is a population of silvery blues you want to move, how many do you have to collect and do you have to take them to a nursery or something first, or can you bring them directly? How does it work? There, there are many experts out there for, 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 for reintroductions for many things, including insects. And in fact, there's a whole, um, we, we can go in another hour about that. But the basic thing, basic conservation biology would say you'd want as much variation as possible and you'd want to introduce enough so that they could take advantage of the existing habitat. We don't know any of the, the, the numbers or parameters for that yet. But one way to figure that out might be, might be to do some tinkering or some mini experiments in the Presidio. So we could use some enclosures or similar similar um, structures to try to see exactly how many butterflies you might be able to uh, rear on how many plants. One of the biggest problems is, unlike the tropical butterflies I study that love to fly around in our dome at the academy, 
the butterflies from flat habitats like grasslands or dunes like to just fly for a long distance. So it's gonna be difficult to figure out how to test how well they're doing if you put them in a cage and all they're doing is bouncing off the wall. So to be okay. determined. Okay. Beth, do you wanna uh, come back and uh, what, do, what, what, what do our audience wanna ask? Our audience wanna ask a ton of questions. I don't know if we're gonna to get to them all. First, there's a number of requests to bring back the passenger pigeon, or the, if, if you got another project that you're, if you're looking for a new one, the passenger pigeon is very popular as well as the Carolina parakeet. So I'll, I'll send everybody really quickly to the Revive and Restore website. They are working with partners on the passenger pigeon. I'm not an expert. Um, ben Novak, who's a partner on this project, their chief scientist and I have discussed it and he is an expert on that. So that's really exciting, good, good idea. Oh, great. Okay, guys, we've got that taken care of for you. Um, and I will find a link to that or Darrell can send me to a link to that. Um, Catherine asks kind of a very broad question and she, she basically just says, I guess the question is why? Don't get me wrong, I'm all for it. But why, why are you doing this for a, for a long gone butterfly? One long gone butterfly. So that's a great question. And you know, the, there's an invertebrate conservation society called the Xerxes Society, named after this first invertebrate to go extinct due to habitat destruction in North America. So in and of itself, a small patch of habitat in a, you know, West Coast city in a big planet, I can get it. There's, you know, why are we doing that? From the point of view of just those butterflies we might bring back there, yeah, maybe there's other things we could spend the money on. But from the point of view of restoring our, our relationship with nature and to give ourselves something to be excited about, this is the species or subspecies to be working on in the place where we have the excitement, the restoration has already occurred at the Presidio. You know, hundreds of thousands of school children hours have gone into to planting the plants that this butterfly can, can feed on as larvae. This can help regenerate our hope for the future. So that's why. And I think, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do is not fly all over the world studying things, even though I still love to do that, but actually starting to pay attention to the backyard. And I was born in the neighborhood that we're working on. So that's pretty cool. Where were you born? I was born in the French hospital, which is now CPMC. So just east of where we're going to, where these butterflies could be released. That's great. Um, I, we have a teacher from Tucson Unified School District who um, is keen to participate in, event, in events um, to protect nature. What can people do? This is really broad, but you're a Cal Academy scientist. What can people do to protect nature? Give us one or two action items. Well, I'm gonna, I'm terrible at that. I'm gonna be shameless. So. Um... You can use, uh, I think the most important thing you can do is to start to connect to your local environments. And one way you can do that is by participating in something we're calling community science. It's often talked about as citizen science, but not everyone's a submit citizen, but we all belong to a community. And the Academy, along with National Geographic, has a, a whole team of, of uh, engineers and, and naturalists who built a platform called iNaturalist. And you can go out and look for silvery blue butterflies or other butterflies with your smartphone using iNaturalist. And by doing that, you are building a modern version of those collections that we had in the Academy drawers for everyone to share and to use to protect nature. So use iNaturalist, collect data, it's just photos, and you'll get something back for doing that. Your photos will be identified by a group of experts other volunteers that learned how to do it, those are the experts, and then they're validated and then uh, by each other. And then the computer actually learns what those look like. So you get instant feedback when you upload a photo to iNaturalist. And it's an app? It's an app. Okay. And I turned off my phone uh, or else I'd show it to you, but I don't didn't want interruptions. What is the larval food plant for the Xerxes? So the Xerxes ate the deer weed, which is a pea family plant called Acmispon glaber. And it's kind of a yellow flowered plant. And we just uh, led a, an informal hike out to 
Point Reyes National Seashore. And you can see this plant several places, marina dunes in, 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 in Monterey, um, at the Presidio and the new restoration or out at Point Reyes and other places. Um, so that's what it eats. Is there a sex, Frederick wants to know, is there a section of the Presidio that has been restored, that has a restored dune habitat analogous to pre-contact Western San Francisco? Well, I, uh, that last bit is a bit, I don't know how analogous it is, but there's a really great restoration just, just north of the Richmond district on the west side. It's called Lobos Dunes. And it's connected to very, very, it's connect, it's right, basically it feeds into Baker Beach. Um, so on the north, on the south side of Baker Beach. And you right, can park near the hospital to access it. Um, we're gonna go a little bit over because I feel like we are all learning a ton. Um, is that okay with John sure, and Daryl? Sure. Okay, great. <laughs> um, are there similar, Bruce Byers asks, are there similar parallel cases where uh, if you are successful at this, it might be a model? Um, or are there other models that you've been, that have been successful that you're learning from? Has anything essentially like this been done before other than in Jurassic Park, of course? I actually think there's plenty. Um, the the trick with this, this, project is that we have, you know, local candidates that we're screening to see what's similar. But there are people working across the planet from looking at um, sea stars to, to uh, mastodons. And I'd just like to thank the Re Revive and Restore. You can look at their website. They're currently funding a number of projects in their wild genomes initiative. We are one of those. And so you can look at their website. Um, to see more, but basically this is now, I think kind of we're part of a wave of, of people trying to figure out how to begin this process. It's a full employment plan for everyone on the planet to rege regenerate nature. And I, I think it's a good one. Um, how far away, this question comes from Julie Seiler who is an Alta contributor and an amazing San Francisco writer, turns out also a fan of this topic. Um, how far away would you estimate Cal Academy researchers may be of um, extracting the genome? And secondly, she's seen blue butterflies in Costa Rica. Are they related? <laughs> okay, so we already, so genomes can mean many things, but but the one of our, our current discussions we're having is whether we want to basically build a new genome sequence, like a contiguous sequence for that butterfly right behind me, or if we're going to compare it to existing genome sequences. And I think that the, that although the jury's out on what we can learn from the latter technique, we're, we're actually very close to being able to do the, the former. And the trick will be to actually, to, to con construct the genome from ancient or degraded museum DNA. So that'll take a while, but I think we could have something by this time next year, we could be telling you a much deeper story. But the, um, the blue butterfly in Costa Rica is more likely to be something called morpho. That's a genus of butterflies that have bright blue um, dorsal sides, and they're quite a bit bigger than the Xerxes. This is just maybe no more than two centimeters. The morpho can be that big and they fly just very lazily through the, through the through the little jungle creek sides. I'm sure you saw that. Can you, Darrell, you mentioned, and I know that we did this in our rehearsal. Can you show us the other side of the Xerxes that sure, behind you? Sure, just give me a second. Um, as long as I don't stop my video. And, oh, you did, it's yeah, okay. I know, and I just have to choose the background. So the, the bottom of the, of the butterfly, can you guys see that? No, we can't see you. Turn your video back. There, here you come. Da -da -da. Okay. So the underside of the Xerxes is what, what's really unique about it. Um, this is a Xerxes type Xerxes. And all these spots are without any pigment. So that's the absence of pigment. And so we would want to know, ultimately we'd want to know what, what happened here, what genes are turned on or turned off to create this open spotted look. And I don't have the picture of the... Uh, the close spotted one, unless I share my screen, do you want to see what that looks like? I mean, if you can, yeah, can we see it? Let me, let me just, uh, oh, disabled. No, or... <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> it's probably a better idea not to probably <laughs> crash the whole talk. All right. All right. This Next might have my technical abilities, but um, but so in the, one of the legs, the leg that you've been able to, there it is. So this would be this this is a the underside of the same but male butterfly that we just saw. And there'll be three legs on each side and two large ones, right? Hang on. I can't really see, but we'll be able to we'll be able to pull all three legs off one side. And you know what this is a real precious resource, so we want to handle it minimally. A lot of the work we would do on categorizing what this looks like would be done on a computer from a photo just like this. Um, this is pretty extraordinary. I we have gone over, um, but you know you can both John and Darrell are, are pretty cool by way of Alta Live guests. So I'm if if you've got more questions, um, I will certainly reach out to them. John, normally I ask, um, you know, the our journalist, is there anything that that you wanted you wanted to be included in this article? Is there anything that didn't make it into your your feature on this? That... <laughs> well, yeah, um, a little bit, you know, there's this guy, is it Ro Robert Pyle? Um, I, I got to talk to him and it was, and he's the guy who proposed this idea 20, 20 years ago. And he was such a wonderful character. Um, the community, I guess I would have liked to dive more into the community of lepidopterists. I thought everyone I met was just the coolest person. And for a Silicon Valley guy like me, it was just such a wonderful change of pace into a, a very different world. So I'd love to know more about that community. Um, I, totally, I totally agree. Can I just mention that yeah. this, this project from since, since Bob Pyle thought about it has invigorated the lepidoptera community in San Francisco and beyond. And I'm just very fortunate to be just jumping in here. And there are many people we haven't talked about today that are critical in figuring out like, where are the current silvery blue populations? What are their host plants? Stu Weiss is one of them. He's worked with the Presidio and others. So it's really great to be part of this big community. It's Robert Michael Pyle, by the way. Right. Yeah. Um, this has been, this has been fabulous. So again, thank you guys. Um, right now, in addition to getting questions, we're getting compliments that this has just been a really fun lunch break for people. So I, I want to thank everyone for attended, attending and let you know, um, again, if you're late to the party, we're going to have this entire conversation up on our website later this afternoon. I'm also going to email it to you. I've been taking hopefully copious notes, not, um, Durrell level PhD notes, but hopefully great notes. And we'll have links for all of you later this afternoon. Tomorrow, taking a very different twist from Butterflies, we are hosting a cartoon masterclass and caption contest with Alta contributing cartoonist Lars Kenseth. That'll be really fun. And next week, we are really excited to welcome to Alta Live uh, our cover artist, Chris Sickles. Believe it or not, this is a miniature, a sculpture that he has created and he's gonna give us a tour of his studio next Wednesday at 12.30 right here on Zoom. I'm gonna send you an invite to that as well. John, you are my new fill-in Alta Live moderator. You were awesome. Um, and Terrell, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and again, to everyone, thanks so much for coming. Stay safe and um, we will see you soon. Take care. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, John. Take care, girl. Okay, you too.